Hello, everybody. We, good morning, afternoon, and evening. Uh, thank you for joining today's webinar uh, hosted by the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Food Safety. Uh, the webinar is focused on harnessing food safety to address global food security. My name is Ahmed Gaballa, and uh, I'll be your MC today. Uh, I'm a senior research associate uh, at Cornell University. Uh, before we welcome uh, today's panel, I would like to direct all attendees to few function on the Zoom webinar. At the bottom of your screen, uh, you will see the chat uh, icon. Please uh, reach out to Matt from Cornell IT. He's providing technical support today. Uh, if you have any experience or technical difficulties, reach out to him. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the Food Safety Innovation Lab website. Uh, our moderator for today is Dr. Martin Weidman. Dr. Weidman is the Gellert Family Professor in Food Safety at Cornell University. He holds both a veterinary doctorate from Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich and a PhD in food science from Cornell University. His work addresses food safety from primary production to the consumer, and his professional career has focused on comprehensive farm-to-table approaches to food safety and food security. With that, let me ask Dr. Martin Weidman to take over and get us started. Dr. Weidman, over to you. Thank you, Ahmed, and good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, good evening. Um, Exciting topic here today. We have almost 200 participants, so, so clearly a very timely and important um, topic. It's just a quick overview of the agenda first before we get started. Um, so our first speaker will be Dr. Robert Bertram from USAID, followed by Bonnie McClafferty and um, Haley Oliver. And then we're going to conclude with a panel discussion with some pre-submitted questions that we will use. Um, next slide, please. To get us started, it's my pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Bertram, who is the Chief Scientist in USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, where he serves as key advice on a range of technical and program issues to advance global food security and nutrition. He leads USAID's evidence-based efforts to advance research, technology, and implementation in support of the US government's Global Hunger and Food Security Initiative, Feed the Future. His academic background is in plant breeding and genetics and includes degrees from, the, from UC Davis, the University of Minnesota, and the University of Maryland. He also studied international affairs at Georgetown University and was a visiting scientist at Washington University in St. Louis. With that, I'll turn it over to Rob. He will not have slides, so if, if you're waiting for slides, don't wait for him, just listen to his, what I'm sure gonna be very interesting starting Rob. remarks. Over to you, Rob. Rob. So thank you, Martin, and uh, I am uh, not going to be using slides, but I'm just delighted to join you all in this kickoff webinar in a series uh, hosted by the Feed the Future uh, Food Safety Innovation Lab. I wanted to start by just recalling a meeting I went to. I don't know if Bonnie was there. It was early days of Feed the Future. We were in India. It was an IFPRI workshop on agriculture and nutrition. And I remember I was asked to comment at the end of several days. And one of the things I said was food safety was missing. Um, and, and I think it was missing for a reason. And it was because it's such a wicked problem. Animal source foods were also not given the attention they deserved in terms of nutrition. But for today's discussion, I think the fact that food safety was missing um, uh, I think that message, I wasn't the only one who felt that. Prabhu Pingali was there from the Gates Foundation at that time, and he said the same thing. So I think we've, we've, we've picked up on this, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm delighted that uh, uh, you know, today we're going to hear about some of the progress we've made and some of the, 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 still the scope of the problem, but also some of the uh, solutions and the, uh, the role of research in trying to deliver some of those um, outcomes. Second thing I wanted to say by means of introduction is that we're living in a food systems world. I don't have to remind any of you. Food systems are a very compelling concept, but they are very messy, uh, complicated, amorphous reality in terms of trying to, to work in them. And this is why 
and, and this is, for example, we don't really have a, a unified theory of change on food systems, but we do need entry points. And that's why work in food safety, for example, is such an important entry point because it, it is a, a key driver of our nutritional outcomes that we're looking for, especially around nutritionally vulnerable people. Uh, and that's the poor and hungry in, in, in the developing world. It's also a hindrance to, to investment in agriculture. I mean, investment in, in production of, of quality nutritious foods where food safety challenges are also the most critical, animal source foods, fruits and vegetables, uh, to, to take a few examples. Um, the other thing that I think is, is, is that I wanted to mention in this regard is, you know, Derek Hetty at IFPRI has done some wonderful work on the affordability of fortified infants foods and the correlation of that with reduced levels of child stunting. But then when Will Masters and others from Tufts went down to Malawi and took a look at what was available in terms of fortified infant cereals, uh, they, they came away with findings that found fortificants all over the map, often missing or very low, but much more worry, worryingly or more worryingly, uh, huge levels of aflatoxin contamination. So this is, even in the, the modern food sector, this problem is persisting. You know, it, so we, it's, it's, it, it's, it's high time in a sense that we're stepping up to seek to address it. So I uh, just wanted to kind of hit those points in terms of the urgency here. I know Bonnie's gonna say more about the extent of the challenge and why it's become such a priority for better nutrition. And I, I actually, Ahmed and Mira gave me some notes to work from. And I, 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 I wanna just say to them, I was gonna say here, there's no food security without safe food. And then I realized when I got to the end of the notes that they had said that too, so we all, think alike on that point. And I think that's a, a good starting point for our the, the seminar series. Um, we've also, in, I wanna say a few words about how we are elevating food safety within uh, USAID and where we've established the division for food safety. This is a first for us uh, and it's housed in the new Center for Nutrition. Um, before uh, we had invested separately in things around say aflatoxins and our work on peanuts, uh, the Nutrition Innovation Lab looked at those issues, um, also the post-harvest loss. And, and now we're, we also did the innovation um, aflastop uh, storage work and market-based uh, multi-donor ag results project in that space. So now we've brought those together into a division that is really going to be looking at uh, answers to uh, the undervalued um, uh, uh, consequences of the health and economic uh, impacts of poor food safety practices in developing countries. And I guess it, it's kind of a sort of cosmic synchrony to think that we're having this discussion in the middle of COVID, which has underscored in everybody's mind the issue of, uh, well, one health certainly, but underpinning that is a, a, a huge food safety issue in terms of safe marketing and, and best practices. So uh, again, I think this is the timing is right for trying to elevate this issue. Um, and I, 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 we know also that alongside the COVID threat, there's been a huge disruption, particularly in those important but also food safety vulnerable value chains, the high nutrition products, the fruits and vegetables, the animal source foods. You, many of you would have heard about shutting down fresh food markets uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a potential response to COVID. Whereas you know, what we really need to do is think about how to operate critically important fresh food markets safely. Um, the other thing I, I think we're saying that when we get into desperate situations and we know 100 million more people are likely to become food insecure over this during this period, that people become more desperate and they're more likely to eat food that isn't safe or spoiled or somehow uh, contaminated. I remember year, decades ago uh, during the Civil War in Mozambique, the terrible stories of people eating unprocessed cassava with tragic results. So again, um, we've learned a lot, 
but there's a lot more to actually mainstream these practices. And I think that's where a, a lot of the work of the lab is going to be aiming in terms of how to, how to really um, drive uh, food safety friendly changes in, in the context of uh, food production and marketing and consumption in the developing world. So um, I think what we like to think about is a holistic and multi-sectoral approach that tries to drive food safety outcomes at a food systems level, but through very clear points of entry. And that, that's a, a real, something that's really just, uh, it's, a, it's sort of a different and complementary approach to say a policy level approach. So the two, I think, need to go together. Um, we're, we're also looking at things around um, uh, contamination, we look at biological ha hazards, and I know uh, the key focus of the lab is public-private partnerships, which Haley's going to talk about more. And that's also critical because so much of this effort actually goes on in the private sector, or so much of what is good practice has to go on in the private sector, either on farm or off. And um, I think uh, the lab has uh, pivoted uh, very uh, admirably to address COVID, uh, it, working in its partner countries of Bangladesh, Cambodia, Kenya, Nepal, and Senegal and Tanzania. They've, um, they've worked with experts from the Cornell Institute of, for Food Safety, and they're partnering with researchers in country and technical expert to provide the kind of science-based information that will help prevent disruptions um, and, and uh, to the, these value chains and keep a safe and affordable food supply available, especially to low income vulnerable consumers. Uh, they, they're preparing, uh, uh, they prepared practical uh, applications, uh, uh, videos, uh, frequently asked questions, checklists, mitigation strategies. This is really um, uh, uh, a great service to our partner countries in Feed the Future. Um, so I, I guess I'll just wrap up uh, Ahmed, Amira, Martin, um, to, by saying that, you know, this, we think this is a con critical contribution towards food safety, along with our other two programs, the Feed the Future Business Drivers for Food Safety, which works with micro, small, and medium-sized food enterprises around market-driven solutions to risk management and also the uh, Eat Safe, which Bonnie's gonna be talking about, which takes a consumer-centered approach. That's the thing I haven't mentioned yet, but thankfully Bonnie's here to talk about that, uh, that consumers, of course, have a key role here as well. So all of these are, are basically part of a collaborative approach driving towards the common goal of ensuring that affordable, safe food for especially low-income consumers in local and regional food systems. That's where the challenges are greatest, not in the internationally traded area where there's strict standards and all, but in the foods markets that poor people depend upon. So this is a priority across the food system from beginning to end. I look forward to the, your work going forward, this series of, of seminars to help guide us in discerning the most strategic ways to try to drive systemic change. And that's what, of course, it's going to take. So uh, the FAODG said this year, if it isn't safe, it isn't food. And I guess that's the same message that we said earlier, that food security can't really come, improved nutrition can't really come unless there's improved food. Thank you very much, uh, Martin, and all the colleagues uh, who uh, invited us to join us today. Thank you, Thank Rob. You, Rob. A very, so very interesting, interesting and important, and important introduction, introduction to this topic. To topic. Um, yeah, I can't can't reemphasize enough that you know. If it, I think your final words, if it's not safe, it's not food, and the importance of food safety and food security just hit home. I think probably is everyone on this um, webinar. So thank you very much for that. Um, and also, wicked food safety is a wicked problem. I think another theme that we will hear more about in this webinar series. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Bonnie McClafferty from the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition. She currently serves as director and chief of party for Eat Safe, evidence and action towards safe, nutritious food. She has more than 25 years experience working at the nexus of food systems and nutrition and health. 
starting with within the research institutes that make up the consultative group on international agriculture research, and since 2011 at the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition. Bonnie serves on the board of, of the World Vegetable Center and the Global Steering Committee of the Program for Aflatoxin Control in Africa, housed at the African Union Commission. And we already heard from Rob the importance of aflatoxin control. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Bonnie. And um, if you want to unmute yourself and share your slides. And we are looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Martin. Let me know when you see my slides. We can see your slides now, so you're a go. Very good. Thank you, Martin. And thank you, Rob. And let me start by raising the clamor and adding my voice to no food. There's no food security without safe food. Um, Rob, yes, I was at that meeting. Um, notably absent food safety, as well as animals. Many of us were scratching our heads, although I was there with the CGIAR and um, not sitting with the ILRI group, so I should have been perhaps. Um, so Rob, thank you for teeing us off into what I think is a real um, well-coordinated and harmonized message that we have here. My task has been to discuss um, the, the food safety um, to address global food security. But before going there, I perhaps should introduce myself. So as mentioned, I am the director of Eat Safe. It's a five-year program that focuses on consumers and consumers in a particularly challenging environment where we are focusing on um, the informal market and whether the consumer actually can help shape the market. So in the absence of governance, in the absence of standards, in the absence of enforcement, is the, does the consumer have anything at their disposal to help make their food environment safer? Um, we were launched along with the Food Safety Innovation Lab, as Rob has discussed. Um, and there's a very clear opportunity through this presentation and through other opportunities to really work with you, the members of the research community, to help us design evidence-based interventions. And so my, pro my, my um, presentation here today will focus on what evidence is out there, what do we need, but from a programming perspective, we need evidence to begin the journey. Uh, and um, I have been working with my team to, who sort of furiously put 1,000 questions in front of me. And so this, um, this presentation will focus on just a few in four particular areas. Before I move on, I do want to um, say hello to some of our colleagues who are on the line. Um, um, Dr. Adewale, uh, thank you very much for joining us from Nigeria. And I believe there are many others. It's great to see all the enthusiasm we have nearly 250 participants who are really wanting to help get involved in this subject. So with my next, with my next charge was to, and I'm sorry, I'm trying to advance the slides and they're not advancing. I'm, oh, there we go, I'm gonna back it up. Okay, so I had been asked to look at the issue of food security and we've all moved on to this big discussion of food systems, which Rob correctly says, you know, they're messy, they're difficult, but it's essential to be looking through a systems approach. Food security, the whole discussion around food security to me is a really great starting point. You know, FAO and others have really gotten us to think about availability and access, and it provides a spot for utilization and the use is critically important because just production and just access without looking at the health, the nutrition and the food safety um, aspects of food security are essential. But, but I'm going to just advance quickly over, and I guess I'm the, first, um, I'm the first participant to be able to put the numbers in front of us that everyone knows, but let's keep those anchored in our, in our minds as we move forward. So we all know that the unsafe foods can cause a variety of acute and chronic health impacts from mild to life-threatening. We know we have one sort of one North Star in our understanding, which was data coming from 2010. So a big message here, and I think probably will resonate with all of those phone is data, data, data. Um, we, from that work um, of what is called the FERG report, we, had under, we now understand 31 foodborne hazards that were responsible for over 600 million episodes of foodborne illness and 420,000 deaths for a total of 33 million disability adjusted life years. Now, 
this is the this is the data we have. We are moving forward with that. We are messaging around that, but we need more. Um, and particularly when we start thinking about um, where we're going to start programming, we need trend data. We need surveillance data. Um, if we can't measure it, it's very difficult to program around it. To even to, I will promise not to bring in more cliches, but um, we really need to be looking at the data. And there is a direct link between foodborne disease impact and nutrition related outcomes, um, such as stunting and wasting. What I'm not putting up here is a context. The context for these data are important. These foodborne hazards, where they take, they indeed um, are, exist globally, the burden falls, as the data is showing, primarily in Sub Saharan Africa, South Asia, and Southeast Asia. And sadly, tragically, um, those who are bearing the brunt are children under five. Uh, I think all of those who work with nutrition would also note it's the same target group we are trying to address with nutrition. So going back, no food security, nutrition security without safe food. So I'd like to just for a second to just quickly look at um, frameworks, because as Rob mentions, we can go from a food, food security lens, important to anchor, but then we actually need a framework for programming. We need a framework to be able to test our assumptions, to hang our investments, and to measure. So the one that we've been using mostly in nutrition and has really become our guiding light is this, what is called the HLPE. And I'm putting this slide up here for people to just position themselves within a systems framework. Um, and to note where the red line is, that food quality and safety appears as one small piece of the entire systems framework. And I think this is what Rob is getting at. We need to elevate food safety because this entire system that tries to get to better diets, nutrition and health outcomes, we're not gonna be able to get there unless food safety is seen as a lens over the entire framework. This Rob will be very familiar with is the recently released um, Bureau of Resilience and Food Security Food Systems Concept Conceptual Framework which takes that um, framework of HPLE and others and really starts to put more of a programming lens on it for USAID. It is incredibly important. Again, diets, income, health, and nutrition are the outcome as well as, of course, environmental sustainability. But you see that there are there is a great attention to drivers, food system supply and demand, and all the investment levers. Again, food safety, water quality, they sit in one place. However, I'm told this is a living document and it is to be evaluated as we learn more. Again, evidence. And USAID is looking at many different entry points. So Rob, thank you very much. You would think that we have coordinated our presentations very well, but I'm coming at the same place. There will be um, a research agenda across this conceptual framework um, to put a food safety lens on a framework which will help us measure, invest, and at chest test many of the assumptions we have as foods move through the system. I just want to pause, Rob, because you um, brought up a really interesting point under COVID and why a systems approach is so important. We have been gathering data. Eat Safe has been gathering the data in data in five countries in Africa, in Asia, in, in informal markets to better understand what are some of the what we're seeing on the ground in terms of consumers' behaviors and vendors' perspectives under COVID. And one of the really interesting results that are coming out in many situations is that, yes, the food system, the supply chain, we need to pay attention, but it's the other environmental factors that take place and, and interact very messily in the markets, such as when you have no waste management in an informal market, that presents a hazard itself to the food system. So where we may be focusing on supply chain interruptions, we also need to be focusing on the environment around the supply chain, in that case, waste management. So that's just an example. So I thought I would spend maybe the rest of our uh, program looking at maybe four clusters, four clusters of area where we at Eat Safe in the field trying to gather information that, in, that moves from demand, from consumer and back through the supply chain 
really that, that, that sees a very clear interaction between health and food safety risks and health and nutrition outcomes. And I thought I'd cluster those in four areas, um, health and physiology, what do, we, what do we know or don't know about consumers? What about supply chains and markets? And what about policy and regulation? And what I, what I pose to the audience and particularly to Haley and colleagues who are really trying to get the evidence for us to move forward with evidence-based interventions, I think our real challenge is going to be prioritization. Um, there are some baseline needs that we have as a community in order to measure. Um, but we are seeing all other opportunities and, and essential information that we need to um, put together evidence-based interventions in the field. So with the health and physiology aspect, I thought, you know, I, in the interest of time, I would focus on just a few. And I think that many of you on the, on the call would agree that foodborne disease incidents among poor into poor poor household income in low and middle income countries, we just don't have the data, we don't have surveillance. And if we don't have surveillance, it's very difficult to know whether we're having any success. So Martin and I were having a, an interesting conversation prior to this, um, this Zoom call to say, you know, really, if we had $10 million, where does it need to go? And that doesn't mean that we wouldn't invest in other things, but we really need more better data. We need trend data, what's happening over time. So that would be the first area where my team is saying, we need, we need more data, you guys, how do we get at this? Then we understand there is a vicious cycle um, that happens when an undernourished mother or child um, gets uh, uh, exposed to a foodborne, to foodborne illness. And in fact, there is this very sort of vicious circle that happens whereby um, uh, the compromised immune systems for malnutrition can't address uh, the foodborne illness and the foodborne illness then reduces consumption of what might be nutritious foods and then malnutrition. So it's a crazy cycle there. And we really would appreciate um, all eyes on this interaction and, and circle around, um, around foodborne illness and malnutrition. And what do we need to know going there in, in, um, in contexts where there are multiple infections going on at any one time. Um, foodborne disease, I'm gonna jump down to the last one. Um, what is foodborne disease doing to nutrient absorption, either in micro or macro? Um, we need to know because we are advocating for particular diets and what, where do we need to be very careful in um, our promotion of certain diets that, um, that and, and the interaction with foodborne disease. So those would be my, my three top for health and physiology. On the consumer side, um, the real, I'm gonna jump right to this, type, this question of, you know, who do consumers trust in food safety and related information? What is going on in the country? Because, you know, consumers are not, we can't call them powerless. You know, we know in these markets, there is not necessarily any surveillance, there's not um, enforcement. Um, and consumers do, we believe, although we need to test it, do have the power to shape the market. So um, when, we are, when we look at, you know, concern for unsafe foods, we really need to look at what are those dietary choices that consumers can make. Um, it cuts both ways. These food safety choices may have a consumer say, you know, a highly packaged processed food is actually safe, but in fact, um, what is that doing to your diet? So um, that would be one area we would really appreciate some insights from, from the research community. The affordability question is absolutely critical. What will safety do to price? Um, I think we need to pay attention to that and be quite clever and put our heads down about that issue. Um, and so those might be the three I, I speak about there and would love to hear. I don't know we have time here, but we would love to interact with um, you folks on the phone about those. So with supply chains and markets, um, you know, the supply chain is responsible for the safety of the foods, you know, with or without regulation. And is there a way that we can incentivize demand for safe foods and supply chains to improve food safety, can you use a market-based approach in, again, in the absence of oversight um, and where we are now? 
Um, the second one I might prioritize here is what are the priorities for infrastructure and equipment development? We know food safety has to hang on infrastructure. In many of the markets and certainly most of the markets where we work, you don't have um, running water, you clean water, you don't have refrigeration, the grid is often highly unreliable. And so where do we begin with an investment in infrastructure and equipment? Um, I think that that prioritization is something we are struggling with, or at least would like to get some, uh, some guidance on. Um, this question of zoonotic pathogens in markets, I know, you know, I'm drawn to that simply because of maybe the time we're living in. But as I read the literature, um, you know, this is often, and particularly in the markets where we work, this is a, a, a clearly an occupational hazard. And there's a gendered dimension to it. And I think that it's really important to look at the gendered dimension to the exposure to zoonotic pathogens, because that from our world will absolutely affect design and programming and interventions and messaging and how we go about um, doing communication to the actors in the supply chain. So um, I would encourage us to look at some of um, those interactions. Finally, with policy and regulation, Okay, where do we start? Um, and before I start these bullets and the priorities, I'd like to give a big bravo to um, the Africa Union Commission that's really beginning to wrestle with this across the continent. Um, so I think that one area that we really have to be looking at is the practicality and the cost of food safety enforcement in, in informal settings. Oftentimes we find that food safety may be moving along um, uh, with the force that it can, but very much focused on export markets. Well, what are the standards for, how do we translate that for the domestic market? And should we? Um, I believe that um, several countries have made the decision or well, why do we have a parallel system for informal market? I mean, for domestic markets as, as export markets, why not bring up the standards to export market standards? But in fact, what's the cost of that? And is that realistic? And what does the journey look like to get there? Um, what is the level of acceptable safety and what are the standards? Are there is, I'm, I'm, I was very intrigued by meeting a meeting in Addis uh, last year, actually two years ago almost, um, where we really took, a, there was a big, big discussion on standards, whose standards, which standards, and in the absence of standards, do you use codex? Do you look at export standards? And so I just think that we have to be very, very practical on this question of standards. They exist, but in what context um, and how appropriate. We at Eat Safe are particularly interested in the role of labeling and signage for safe and nutritious foods. Um, there are some who would say labeling um, doesn't have a role. You can't see um, how do we, you can't see the foodborne illness that is most critical. Um, but in fact, if we are to, to empower the consumer, to um, choose safer and better diets. We need to look at labeling, we need to look at knowledge. And so the question is, you know, how, how can we begin to look at labeling or signage to help the consumer make informed choices? So Martin, um, I believe I may have filled, fulfilled my 15 minutes here. Um, this, the takeaway message really is that we do need these frameworks. We need to put a food safety lens on existing frameworks. USAID, I believe, is making a huge effort in this area. And Martin, uh, you and I were having during our conversations prior to this, you know, we are at the very beginning of this. There's great work going on. And I, and I, and I kind of have this image of my head where we have many flashlights in the dark going in a single direction within their own flashlight, but we need to bring them together to shine a light on this big problem um, rather than be individual lights in the dark. So thank you, Martin. Thank you, everyone. And Martin, back to you. Great, thank you. And thank you for leaving us with this impression of the flashlights in the dark that are trying to solve this wicked problem. Um, with that, it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, um, Dr. Haley Oliver. Um, she is a professor of food science at Purdue University and the director of the Feed the Future, Future Innovation Lab for Food Safety, the group that is sponsoring and organizing this webinar series. She completed her BS um, in molecular biology and microbiology at the University of Wyoming and received a PhD in food science 
um, from Cornell University. Her current research focuses on prevalence, persistence, and transmission of Listeria monocytogenes in Salmonella, with a specific focus on retail food system, as well as the development of practical and feasible control strategies aimed to reduce cross contamination. In addition to her work with the Food Safety Innovation Lab, she has been working to develop food safety capacity in Afghanistan, Nigeria, and Peru. With that, it's my great pleasure to turn over the microphone to my friend and colleague, Haley Oliver. Thank you, Martin. We should be loading up slides here. Yes, we see your slides. So I um, think you might want to move to your first slide or slide. Yep. There you're, we are. You're All right. ready to go. And if you want to put it on full screen, maybe. Uh, sorry, that it's not showing that way. It's good as it is, if you All need right. to. We'll, we'll go on just in the interest of time. Um, thank you for the introduction, Martin. And, and thank you to the over 250 participants in this webinar. And it is one in a series of five. And um, we welcome you. And, and thanks for joining as we explore um, what food safety is and how it really ties into the bigger challenges of food security. So it's my pleasure to introduce the Food Safety Innovation Lab. Uh, the Food Safety Innovation Lab is USAID's investment in food safety research. And this lab is a partnership between Cornell and Purdue University, where we can bring together um, two of the most established food science departments um, really in the world, coming together with our technical expertise to really dive into the research needs in food safety from a global perspective. So our award started in 2019, so we're about one and a half years into this really exciting experience um, and look forward to really expanding our research portfolio as, as time progresses. And as Dr. Bertram mentioned, we, um, COVID has played, a, a, has impacted lives. Um, if it hasn't impacted lives, your life, I'm not sure how you avoided it, um, but it has impacted the work that we do here in the Food Safety uh, Innovation Lab as well. And we'll get to that in just a moment. Our country focuses are Bangladesh, Cambodia, Kenya, and Senegal, but we have since expanded um, where we work in the wake of COVID. And Bonnie highlighted um, some of these statistics previously, but really what motivates our approach is the number of children and individuals that uh, above five too that die from foodborne diseases um, with over 600 or 600 million estimated cases as well. That's a significant health impact, but also economic impact. Um, the motivation and really the, the drivers of the research portfolio for the Food Safety Innovation Lab are informed by the Global Food Safety Partnership meta-analyses, which was published, um, I believe, in February of 2019, which highlighted that while there have been a number of significant investments from both the public and private sector to combat food safety, the vast majority of those investments have really focused on chemical hazards, where we actually um, where, where things like aflatoxins actually land. And yet if we look at the, at the challenges in foodborne disease, the vast majority actually come from microbial or bacterial hazards. And so that really remains one of the focuses of our lab is to um, accelerate research in this area to better understand what the risks are. And, and again, a really lively discussion um, of our panel members prior to the launch of the webinar, underscoring that there's a lack of data at the foundation of what disease levels are. So it's difficult then to actually measure change if we don't have some of that foundational information. So as we look at the charge of the Food Safety Innovation Lab, we really have uh, are charged with addressing three major areas of inquiry. The first is how does food safety actually interface and then improve human nutrition and outcomes. The second is how does food safety actually, through improved safety, how do we reduce risk and mitigate risk so that we can actually achieve the long-term goal of the path to resilience. And then finally, our work, um, our funded research portfolio really is designed to um, really support economic development as well. The, as, as Dr. Bertram mentioned, the private sector plays a significant role uh, a significant role in, um, uh, in, in our uh, ability to actually advance food safety. Hey, Haley, quick, yes. you'll be still on your first slide. Oh. Um, so they may not be advanced. If you want Ahmed to run them for you, we can do that if that makes it easier. Um, how about now? Um, 
I still see the first slide. All right. Um, so, Ahmed, Ahmed, why don't you throw up Haley's slides? Haley, can you, then... can you press F5 on your computer for the slideshow? Five? F5. F5. Yes, please. Yeah, I'm not getting a response. Yeah. The, All right. I didn't... Ahmed, Ahmed, run it from your computer, please. I don't. As, let me try again. Yeah. In... All right, that looks better. Yes. All right, excellent. Well. So you're well, on the slide that says cross-cutting themes, yeah, just wonderful. to make sure. Excellent. Okay. Um, great, so, so as we think about our research portfolio, um, ranging from consumer awareness to um, adapting and advancing technologies that can improve food safety from either pathogen detection um, or, or monitoring disease outcomes. Some of our cross-cutting themes are really um, what, what are the glue among all of the research investment. So the three things that we look for in each of our research investments, one is that we are empowering women, youth, and other marginalized populations. We know that women make uh, uh, the vast majority of decisions around food and, and how children interface with food. So empowering them and, and helping them make safe choices or, or toward safer food really has long-term impacts. And if you can educate women and educate youth, then you have educated someone for a lifetime. The other cross-cutting theme that we uh, address is developing human and institutional capacity. Um, you know, the innovation labs are housed at US universities where our main goal is really to teach and train students. And we extend that approach um, to, uh, to our research programming in that we, our partners are actually training graduate students or undergraduate students in their, in their research um, for the next three and a half years. And then the final uh, cross-cutting theme is really enabling environments. So that's our ability to look at um, regulatory structure, the infrastructure of universities, all of these multiple layers that have been addressed by other panelists that need to come together in order um, for us to truly achieve our, um, our goal of food safety. I see I'm not able to advance my slides either, wow. I apologize. I'll try again. Are you able to see my slides? I see a slide that says management entity. Oh, okay. All right, wonderful. Well, so the... Um, yeah, and you've been back to cross-cutting theme now, so it seems no, like I, you... I actually have no control over my slides. I, I really... I'm going to give you control of my screen. Thanks, Molly. Uh, just bear with us as we yeah, run Haley's slide from another computer. Yeah, so. go ahead. Molly, if you, can you advance the slide? Thank you. And we'll go ahead and skip past this one. Um, an important part of informing um, our research portfolio is, is our advisory committee. And this is an external group uh, chaired by Dr. Catherine Bohr at Cornell University um, to, to make sure that we have a, a focused lens on, on, re on research that is impactful and meaningful. Next slide, please. As a design of the Food Safety Innovation Lab, um, our initial year uh, of, of existence was really spent launching and gaining information and research from our Quick Start projects. And we have elected to work in Bangladesh, Cambodia, Kenya, and the surrounding countries, and Senegal, where we, uh, the common theme among these research investments was that we wanted to have uh, a landscape or understand the current situational analysis, the situational analysis of food safety from both a policy and um, best practices standpoint in each of these countries. And so um, in the interest of time, um, I think we'll, we'll stay here with um, addressing each of what those quick start investments were. So Seth Guru was the implementer um, of our uh, initial work in Bangladesh. And they conducted a really nice assessment of the food safety risks and scientific capability um, of Bangladesh and really took kind of a, a government and enabling environments lens to understand 
um, the, the current state of food safety policy in Bangladesh. And that report is under review and will be available on our website in the very near future. In Cambodia, um, our colleagues at Kansas State and fellow colleagues here at Purdue University in partnership um, with the Royal University of Agriculture at Phnom Penh began our investigation of bacterial contaminations in fruits and vegetables and really trying to find a, a practical approach to reducing those risks. As I mentioned, one of the, the roles of the Food Safety Innovation Lab is to um, really take a hard look at bacterial contamination and still complement the work that's been done on chemical hazards. Again, this was a, a truly first um, initial effort to look at baseline contamination levels in produce in Cambodia. In Kenya, the International Livestock Research Institute served as our partner to conduct a situational analysis of food safety in East Africa. And so not only did we look at Kenya, but a number of the surrounding countries that constitute the EAC, um, really nice report that will be again um, available in the very near term. Um, they also, of course, took a lens of looking at the impacts of COVID on these countries and food safety concurrently. So we're making the most out of these really challenging times of COVID um, to, to actually understand what, what is the basal level of food safety challenges, but how did COVID actually impact that as well? In Senegal, Purdue University, um, in partnership with ISRA, conducted some initial microbial testing in groundnuts or peanuts. While there's a, a vast uh, amount of data understanding aflatoxin risks and challenges in peanuts, uh, the question remained is what, was, what were the bacterial challenges maybe? So that interesting interface of, of food safety and quality. Um, it's a fine line, they are, they are different, and yet we can have high quality food that's unsafe, uh, which, which of course is what we were trying to uh, more closely investigate here in Senegal. And that work um, will be published in peer review publications in the very near term. Well, if you could switch to our COVID slide, that would be wonderful. Dr. Bertram mentioned that um, you know, we have an ongoing project um, in, an, in our partner countries, um, in addition to Nepal and Tanzania. And we um, were very fortunate that we could leverage the ongoing work at Cornell University's Department of Food Science supporting the food industry here on the domestic side, that we could take the materials and, and programming that they already had underway and extend it and offer it to our partner countries, again, Bangladesh, Cambodia, Kenya, and, and the greater region. So um, as Dr. Bertram also mentioned that we are, that group is training local subject matter experts on how local food industries can manage the COVID challenge. To be clear, there's, there's no evidence that, that, um, that COVID-19 or that the disease itself can actually be transmitted through food, but it has an impact on food systems because of changes in access to food or uh, workers being able to actually produce food. And that was really particularly notable here um, on the domestic site here in the United States. And so we're supporting um, individuals to help improve the, the situation of, of work and, trans, and prevent transmission among workers as they produce safe foods and maintain to the best of our ability food security. Though as, as Dr. Bertram mentioned, that is certainly going to be challenging uh, for the next couple of years. Next slide, please, Molly. So as our quick starts were our nine month research investments. And they were able, uh, that informed really our entire research portfolio moving forward for the next three and a half years. In April of this year, so despite COVID, we continued to conduct work and move the innovation lab forward by releasing our first RFA, so our first request for research ideas, focusing on our countries, um, as mentioned, but, but targeting those high risk foods. And I think Bonnie did an excellent job of highlighting those foods that are, that are often the most nutritious are also those that are more likely to be unsafe if they're uh, either less processing such as fruits and vegetables or as it's pretty well established animal based foods. And so um, we've conducted our first RFA on our, in the, um, the process of, of contracting and uh, and finalizing selection of that research portfolio. And you should see announcements from us um, in the very near term, uh, in the next few, few weeks really, showcasing the long-term trajectory of the Food Safety Innovation Lab. And of course, COVID continues to impact food, food systems around the world. Um, 
And so we anticipate um, as, as that need, as it continues, that we will hope for an opportunity for subsequent RFAs in the future. Um, thanks, next slide, Molly. So um, I've already mentioned really the foods uh, that we're focusing on and, and we will be releasing um, again, a, a highlight of where the entire research portfolio will be going in the next couple of weeks. On the final slide, it's, it's my pleasure of, um, to, to thank um, the uh, USAID for the investment in the Food Safety Innovation Lab. Um, we're the research branch of trying to help identify the biggest questions and hopefully solutions to those challenges. Thanks, and back to you, Martin. Great, thank you, Haley. Um, we'll have time for a few of the, the pre-submitted questions, uh, pre-contemplated questions. So, um, Rob, uh, Dr. Proctor mentioned the issue of um, food safety being a wicked problem. And wicked problems are defined as, as problems that, that social or cultural problems that are difficult and impossible to resolve for many reasons, including incomplete, contradictory knowledge, the number of people involved, the large economic burden, and finally, the interconnected nature of these problems. So Rob, maybe you can answer this, address this first. How do we, how do we solve food safety as a wicked problem? How do we address it? And, and how would that feed into the strategy USAID is using in terms of either you know, other agency initiatives or cross agency collaborations to address that? Well, thanks, Martin. Um, in a way, I think it should be I asking you that question, but <laughs> not the other way around. But I will, I will say a few things anyway. Um, I think one of the things that we would want to start with would be discerning the most pressing vulnerabilities, and as we we've, we've some of those have been mentioned. Uh, I, I think the the, the aflatoxin issue, the um, the issues around um, safe, uh, fresh food markets um, and production practices and so forth. Um, so I, I, that, those would be the places where one set of them that I would be very interested in where I think the food safety community's work needs to inform what our other partners are doing, the Livestock Lab, the, our work with the World Vegetable Center or with uh, the well, we are setting up a new horticulture program. And I know uh, my colleagues like Ahmed and Mira and Kelly Cormier have given a lot of thought to how to position the food safety lab that, that I had the pleasure, actually, I forgot to mention, I was at the launch and it was great uh, with our deputy administrator back last year in, in uh, West Lafayette. And I, I know you were there as well. Um, you know how to how to position those so that you can inform the larger community so that's one challenge the other one i guess would be the one on the policy side and uh, where um and that when i say policy i also mean the private sector and i i really appreciate dr oliver's um, underscoring uh that the importance of working with the private sector in this space but there's a public sector piece as well and somehow i think we need to think about how those two can work together uh, in a way that's realistic. I mean, it's one thing to set standards, it's quite another thing to see them enforced. In, in and then finally, just to say again that while, you know, I, I think Bonnie made this point, it's, it's those local and regional markets where the vulnerabilities really lie, um, you know, in terms of the, the countries that we're working in and the vulnerable populations, low income people in general that we're, we're trying to, who, whose diets we're trying to improve. So that's not a very specific answer, but um, I hope, you know, I, I think the, the, the actionability is, is something that we'd be looking for. So, uh, and I, I, again, we're really looking to you all to help us move forward on this. Haley, you wanna add how the Food Safety Innovation Lab can help or is, is trying to address that, the, the, the idea of this being a wicked problem? Certainly, certainly, and, and thanks for your comments, uh, Dr. Bertram. Uh, yeah, the Food Safety Innovation Lab, um, the management team and, and our, um, our reach and connection with industry, I think is one of, the, um, one of the, the major positives that we can bring to this research lens is um, we, we in, our, in our other lives, have research partnerships with the private sector, and we are, ex are hoping to and, and asking our partners to extend that same type um, of relationship. And, and it's scaled from local entrepreneurs 
um, but we, we are welcoming and encouraging large international um, food systems or trades such as uh, Cargill or PepsiCo. While they're large corporations, they have wide reach and they've a number of lessons learned about, um, of, about food systems, how to source safe foods from all over the world. And we wanna see that translated across all the entire scope of, of the economic spectrum. Great, thank you, Haley. Um, maybe you know, ask Bonnie to weigh in on this and, and also sort of include, you know, how can the Eat Safe project complement the Food Safety Innovation Lab to, to achieve solving these, these complicated interconnected issues and how, how do you see that going forward? Thanks, Martin. Um, and thank you, everyone. You know, we have from the very beginning when these three awards were, um, were when the three programs were awarded, um, Haley, myself, and Russ Webster, who runs business drivers for food safety, uh, you know, got together because we realized very much that a coordinated approach um, whereby we are reading what's going on on the ground or not, um, really can start to feed into an agenda for the Food Safety Innovation Lab. And I think that hats off to Haley as this was designed because a lot of the what's coming out um, in terms of the emphasis that needs to be placed on food safety doesn't necessarily sit in, in the world of um, toxicology and just microbes. She is looking at governance. Um, this will take us to the consumers. And there is, a, there is a wonderful kind of synergy that's developing here, but we are only a very small piece where we sit now. So in terms of consumers, we're feeding Haley what we've learned, what we're seeing, um, what are the complexities in the informal markets? What is consumer need? What are their behaviors? And we, we, we share our experiences actually um, on a quarterly basis. So actually every two months we go back and forth and, and learn. Now as COVID has kind of kept us out of the field, that still is, that doesn't mean we're not busy. Uh, there's a lot of protocol we need to pull together that we share, we can share. And, and so uh, when it comes to the consumer and the ability to demand food safety from markets and it trickling back through the supply chain, there's a lot um, we, are in, we can interface with the Food Safety Innovation Lab. Great. Thank you so much. Um, this might have been the fastest one hour Zoom webinar um, that I've attended. It's a great job. Um, from everyone, all the speakers today. Great interactions from the participants too. We will download your comments. We will get back to you individually. Some of you asked to be connected with people and we will do this. This was the first out of five webinars. Um, our next one will focus on food safety and one health approaches to reducing foodborne pathogen and zoonotic diseases. There were actually some questions about zoonotic diseases in, in the chat box today. So. Hopefully you and many others will dial in again for our next webinar on November 19th. Um, this was a trial balloon. Again, we realized we had a lot of questions, a lot of good comments. So we'll probably try to dedicate some more time to answering some of those in the, in the subsequent webinars. Thank you very much for attending this, this first webinar. Thank you again to all of our speakers and thank you to USAID for funding this, this really, really important um, innovation lab. Um, with that, um, this is it for today. Hope to see you all on November 19th. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. So Thank long. you. Thanks, Thank Rob. you, Rob. Thank you, Martin. Thank, Thank you, Haley. Everybody. Take care, everyone.